Hi, my name's Paul Grogan and welcome to my top 10 games video of 2021. For those people who are watching this video shortly after it comes out, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, Paul's just misspoken there because it's currently the end of 2022. Uh, for regular viewers of mine, you will know that this is a, a normal thing, but I do my top 10 games of the year a long time after everybody else. Now, I'm doing this one in December 2022, that is a bit longer than I wanted to do, uh, so next year I'm going to aim to do them around the summer. But why do I do these after everybody else? And let's just get this out of the way first. I believe that doing a video at the end of the year, like literally everybody else does, um, that's I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. And the reason for it is there's a huge number of games that come out during the year. Uh, a lot of games get released in the last quarter of the year, mainly around Essen Spiel time, around October, things like that. Uh, and out of all the new games that have come out at Essen this year, which are 2022 releases, a lot of them I've only played once. And it's only until we get to probably March or April time of the next year that I feel comfortable in rating those games. It's just not possible right now for me to tell you the best games of 2022. Um, even though I've got a video on the channel about that, that's more of just sort of general discussion and votes from my Patreon supporters. My own personal thoughts on what are the best games from this current year, right now I don't know, because I, I haven't played them enough. However, 2021, that's what we're going to talk about in this video. Uh, and as I say, I've, I've left it enough time that I've played these games a number of times, most of them anyway, uh, and I've been able to have a really good think about them so that I can, I can, I can rate them. Now, a couple of things just before we start. First of all, a big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters for funding the channel. This video is not sponsored in any way. I've not made any money from this video and all advertising revenue goes to charity. So I'm only able to make these videos thanks to the support of my Patreon campaign. So yeah, huge thank you to you. And if you want to support the channel and help me carry on making more videos, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. What else? Bias. Yeah, let's talk about my bias and my involvement. Some of the games that I'm going to talk about here are ones which I was professionally involved in. Either I was a tester on them, or I wrote the rulebook, or I've done a video on them. If you're watching this video and you think that there is some element of personal bias in some of my choices because I worked on them, then you're watching the wrong channel. There isn't any, I can guarantee you that. Uh, I have managed to distance myself from the work that I did on these projects from what I personally think about them. So yeah, this is a, a completely bias-free thing. Now, it does happen that obviously if I'm professionally involved in a project, that means I've played it. Whereas there are some great games that come out every year that I just don't have chance to play. So. If you're watching this video and you get to the end of it and you're like, oh, well, why didn't Paul mention such and such a thing? That was one of the best games. You're probably right. Uh, there's too many games that come out each year and I'm not able to cover all of them. So I'm curious to know what, what in the comment, leave me a comment in the video. What is your favorite games that I didn't cover in this video? Because I can guarantee as I was looking through the list of games that were released in 2021, I was like, well, that's supposed to be really good and that's supposed to be really good. And I just haven't had a chance to play them. Whereas... Going back to what I was saying at the start, if I'm professionally involved in a project, either writing the rule book or doing a video, it, it means I'm going to play it. And, and that that's just how it is. I'm also running a contest as part of this video. So uh, I've contacted the publishers of my number one game and basically were given away a copy of those games. Now, the details are still being finalized as I'm recording this uh, as to where that copy can go and all of the final details. But going to be running a contest and apo apologies that this is a little bit vague, but I only came up with this idea yesterday. Uh, and as I say, I've still got some emails outstanding to clarify some of the details. But I'm going to be running a contest and you can win a game. And if you want to, just leave me a comment uh, in the description of this video with what was your favourite game of 2021. Uh, and I will get you entered into the contest. Okay, so let's start by covering some honourable mentions. Coming up with these lists is actually really hard for me. It takes me a lot of time. Uh, I go through all of the games that I've played, all of the games that got released, and I, I try to rate each one of them. And normally there are some easy choices to make, but there are actually some also very difficult choices to make. And certainly when we got down to the bottom of the top 10, I had about five or six games that I was thinking, well, I think all of these are roughly as good as each other. I've enjoyed all of these. It's really hard. So I've got a few honorable mentions that haven't quite made it into my top 10, but on another day, they might. Uh, so, first of all, we have Mini Express. Mini Express is by Mo Ideas, designed by uh, Mark Gerritz, um, following on for Mini Rails. Now, Mini Rails, same publisher, same designer, but a completely different game. Other, other than they're both, they're both small box trains game. 
Uh, Mini Express is a game which I initially liked a lot when I started playing it. It's relatively streamlined. Well, in fact, it's very streamlined. The rules are relatively simple. It has a number of things about train games, about you trying to increase uh, influence or stocking various companies and things like that. But it plays in about 45 to 60 minutes. Um, yeah, so I, I played it a few times and really liked it. Then I had a couple of games of it where I was like, oh, I'm not getting this. This is I, I, I didn't really enjoy it. But then I went back to the game because there's a there's a UK map uh, and, a, and there's some other maps coming out for the game as well but specifically the UK map, designed by Tony Boydell, uh, made me sort of go back to the game. And then I had a, two or three games of it with the UK map, and I was like, oh, this is actually a really good game. So yeah, Mo, uh, Mini Express, Mo Ideas, there you go, honourable mention. Right, next up is Tabanusi. Now, Tabanusi, uh, designed by Daniel Tashini and David Spada, uh, published by Board and Dice. This is one of the tea games. There's been a lot of tea games over the years. Uh, this is one of them, but uh, this one stood out to me as I, I really enjoyed this one. Uh, I've only played it, I think, about two or three times, maybe three times, um, which is why it, I mean, it might be higher on the list. Um, but yeah, I played this one. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed the, the the dice selection and the general building of the board. I did feel it worked better at a higher player count because you've got a lot of uh, good player interaction with people building foundations and then other people using them. Um, but yeah, so Tabanusi, that's that's in my list of honourable mentions. Next up is Messina 1347. Now this could have very easily got into my top 10 if I'd played it more. This is a game that after I played it a couple of times, I've been wanting to play it more. And in fact, just in this last week, they've released uh, an online version of the game. You can play it over at ukata.de. Um, and I've been meaning to get some games in. So again, this is a game which, if I played it more, it could have actually made my top 10. It was a solid Euro game. Um, designed, co-designed by Vladimir Suhi and uh, Raul Fernandez Aparicio. Apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, I think this was the first co-design um, that Vladimir did, because of course this year he's had Woodcraft, co-designed by Ross Arnold. Um, solid, medium weight Euro game. It's like all of the games by Vladimir Suhi, they're all in the roughly the same sort of category. Underwater cities may be a little bit heavier, uh, but I liked this one. Uh, I also felt the thematic integration in this one worked somewhat slightly better than some of his other games. These games are not known for being highly thematically uh, integrated with the mechanisms, but in this one I felt that the way that the rats spread and the way that you had to isolate people that were ill, but while they were isolated you could get them to do some work while they were stuck in a barn which is apparently historically correct. So yeah, Messina 1347, really enjoyed it, want to play more. Finally, in the list of honourable mentions, now this is the German version of the game, so don't laugh, but this is Free Ride. It actually says Free Ride on the side, um, but they, it's, um, yeah, I won't try and pronounce that, but this is Friedman Fries's game. Now, Friedman Fries is a genius of games design. Uh, he's better known for games like Power Grid, um, and Free Ride, I think, possibly went under a lot of people's radar. Uh, this is a train game. It's sort of a little bit like Ticket to Ride, but a bit more involved. Um, and I played this game, and it was it was a surprise in that I played it, and I was expecting a, uh, an okay game, and it was just really, really good. Again, streamlined rules, very clever. It's a train game, but with a difference. You're building track on the board, and that track is owned by you, and then when somebody uses it, you get paid but then it becomes owned by the state and it becomes neutral. Uh, the, the, the mechanism for picking up which cities you're going to be going to, that's really good and that really works well. There's a solo mode included as well. It takes up to five players. Uh, and yeah, everybody I've played this with has really enjoyed it and I think it's a bit of an under the radar hit. Almost in my top 10. Really, really close to being in my top 10. And again, possibly, possibly should have been. Right, so that's the list of honorable mentions. Now let's get onto the actual top 10 list. So coming in at number 10 is Cocapelli. Cocapelli is by Stefan Feld, published by Queen Games, and this is the least Stefan Feld, Stefan Feld game in my collection. Stefan Feld game, what, Stefan Feld, one of my favourite designers. I've got more games of his in my collection uh, than anybody else, and a lot of his games are very similar in the way that they work. This one is very different. You would play this game and not realise that it's a Stefan Feld game, and then when somebody told you it was the Stefan Feld game, you'd be like, no, surely not. Um, but this is this is something quite different. It's primarily a card game uh, and it plays smoothly. And the way that it, feel, it felt to me when I first played it a little bit like Dominion in that there are a whole bunch of different cards to choose from. 
and you choose a certain amount of those cards for the game. Each card has a certain special power, and therefore the combination of cards that you use will mean that your games will play differently, a la Dominion. Um, not like any other Stefan Feld games. But what's different in this game is that, unlike the other deck building games, and there isn't really deck building in this game, um, you're not buying cards from a common supply. Each player starts off with their own deck of cards and you will go through that deck of cards. And everybody's deck at the start of the game is identical based on the cards that you've selected. Um, but yeah, really like Cocapelli. Um, it wasn't a big hit, which is unfortunate. I did get the expansion set with it because I think once you've got the expansion set, which includes basically some extra cards, you've got a lot more variability. And I was really hoping that the game would take off, be really popular, and that there would be potentially more expansion sets coming out uh, in future. I don't think it was. I think it was a bit of a... Uh, I, I don't think it performed that well. I don't think it was the success that maybe the, but they were hoping for. Um, but yeah, Cocopelli by Stefan Feld, published by Queen Games. Number 10 on my list of best games from 2021. Moving on to number 9. And this is where I regret the decision to have the physical boxes instead of just putting a digital overlay on screen. And that is because my number 9 choice is... Euthea, <sighs> Torment of Resurrection, which is a big box that I don't want to turn sideways in case all of the bits fall out. Um, yeah, so this, this is a big game. Um, and the reason why this made my top 10 list is because the game is just really good. Now, the biggest downside of this game is it's a huge game. It's an epic scale game. As you, you can see from the box, there's a huge amount of content. The rule book is absolutely massive, um, and the game takes a long time to play, right? The, it's not, not denying it, this is an all-day game. In fact, there's multiple scenarios included in this game. There's a huge amount of replayability, multiple characters, multiple, multiple scenarios. Some of the scenarios have got configurable difficulty levels. There's just so much game in here. But the playtime that it lists is for those people who are, like, experts at the game and can play it without even thinking about it. For everybody else, you want to double or even triple that playtime. So, yeah, expect that you're in for a long game when you play this game. I and mean, we're not talking like three hours, four hours. We're talking possibly six, eight, ten, even twelve for some of the longer scenarios. Um, but putting that aside, the game is very, very well done. This is first-time designers, first-time publishers, and the game is just really, really well done. Now, I was professionally involved in this. I did work a lot on the rule book, but I don't think I had anything to do with the design. I might have suggested a couple of things during development, but the credit for how good the game is uh, goes to the designers of the game and to Dire Games for, for the original publication. Now, unfortunately, Dire Games have run into problems, but thankfully another company has stepped in and is going to pick, pick up the game uh, and it looks like it's going to continue and be available for other people. Um, but yeah, every time I've played this game, even though it takes a very, very long time, I'm completely and utterly immersed in it. And it, you, you're playing the game and you're doing all of these things and the things themselves don't seem to take much time. And then you look at the clock and you're like, oh, five hours have passed. How has that happened? But yeah, fantasy setting can be played solo. Solo mode is really good. Can be played cooperatively, can, can be played competitively. It's got all of the things that fantasy adventure game here has. It's got leveling up your characters, going around fighting monsters. Uh, the way that the combat works is very clever is that another player actually takes over control of the monster uh, and they're playing cards against you. It's just, just really clever. Now, there's a huge number of games out there that are fantasy-based, killing monsters, cooperative or whatever. Um, what sets this one aside? Well, as I said, there's just so much about this game. The production quality was fantastic. The artwork, the attention to detail. To some extent, you could criticise it for having too much content. Because there's just so many, there's so much stuff in there and there's so many options in there. But unlike some other games where the bloat just ends up, you know, breaking the game and going out of control, in this it just adds to it. So yeah, really good. Would like to play it a lot more. It's just, as I say, the playtime does keep this from getting to the table. But if you like this kind of game, this is just great. So this is Euthea, Torment of Resurrection. This is my number nine choice. Right, number eight on my list is Boone Lake, DLP Games, Capstone Games, Alexander Pfister. It's probably no surprise that this is on my top ten list because Alexander Pfister is one of my favourite designers and 
I'll be honest with you, I haven't played this game anywhere near as much as I would like. I've played this game probably as much as some of the games on my honourable mentions. So why did this get into my top 10? Well, everything that I've, the, the, the games that I had of this game, I enjoyed more than the other games. And this is a game I definitely want to play more. Now, Alexander is known for reiterating a number of his previous ideas into his newer games. And this has a similar mechanism to Maracaibo in the way that players are moving down a route. Uh, but it doesn't have the one one player gets to the end, everybody goes back to the start kind of thing. It does have that halfway through, um, but it, it kind of tweaks that a little bit. But you have the option of do you move far and thus speed the game up so that it's basically everybody has fewer rounds, or do you go slowly and get more resources? One of the things that I really liked about this game is the card mechanism. So in Boon Lake, there are so many ways that you can cycle cards from your hand. But one of the core mechanisms in the game is just you know, either play a card or discard a card for too many. So you're constantly playing cards, discarding cards, drawing new cards and everything else. And in a game with lots of cards, you want to be cycling them around fast so that you can get ones that, you know, that, that are going to be good for you and you have lots of choices. So yeah, the setting for this game is slightly unusual, um, but put the setting aside, that doesn't really matter. Mechanically, I think this game is really good. One of the best parts mechanically about this game is the way that the, uh, the four scoring tiles come out. But it's so good, but they should have been worth more points. It's a really, really good idea. It's really clever uh, in the way that it works. But in, in, the relatively, uh, in the relative scheme of how many points you get in the game, that part of the game, I felt, could have been worth more points just because it's really cool and it's done really well. There is a solo mode to this game, which I've not managed to try yet. I do really want to try the solo mode. The people that I know that have played the solo mode have also said it's really good. But yeah, Boon Lake, definitely one of the games that I want to play a lot more of. And it might even go higher on my list um, if I did. But yeah, really enjoyed that. So that is Boone Lake, my number eight choice. Number seven on my list is a game which until last night was actually on my honourable mentions list. But as I looked last night at my list, I was thinking, oh, wait a minute, let's just reevaluate these a bit more. Let's have a think about them a bit more. And then I moved this game from my honourable mentions list, not only into my top 10, but actually at number seven. And I'm not sure about this, but Super Skill Pinball, ramp it up. So this is just really, really good. And Super Skill Pinball, there's a new version of it coming out every year, but the ramp it up version takes the base game of Super Skill Pinball and adds to it ramps, obviously. Um, and I've not even played all of the different tables in this yet, but Super Skill Pinball is a fantastically fun game. The rules are relatively simple, but, the, but then you've got a lot of special rules for each individual table. But the thematic integration of the way that uh, the actual mechanisms of the game with the dice rolling, choosing the dice and everything else, they all fit. And the way that uh, Jeff Engelstein, the designer, has put in so much theme into each of the individual tables to get them to feel, you know, like pinball tables from the, from the 80s, which is really, really good. Uh, the last one I played of this was the heist where you're basically in a casino and you've got to uh, disable security cameras, you've got to break through locks to go into the vault to try and steal money. And it's a pinball game and it's just rolling dice. It's a roll and write game with wipeable boards, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I would very, very rarely say no to a, a game of this. My only downside of this game is it can take a little bit long. This is a game which would be fantastic if it was 45, 60 minutes. Uh, and you play a series of three rounds. You could play fewer rounds. You could just play two rounds if you wanted to. But I found that the three round games do tend to go on for about an hour and a half. Now, in that time, it is fully engrossing and, you know, you're fully active all of the time. And you're all playing at the same time. So there's no downtime while you're waiting for other players, really. Um, but yeah, the game does last a little bit longer than I would like. Um, but yeah, Super Skill Pinball, really good. The Ramp It Up is the second box set. Uh, and it's not an expansion. They're all, they're all standalone. So you can get this one without having the base game or any of the other ones. It's just a lot of fun to play. Number six on my list is a game which I don't have the box for, and also it's, it's two games. So let me show you this box, but this isn't the right one. This is Unlock. So in 2021, according to Board Game Geek, uh, Unlock released two boxes. First of all, there was the Legendary Adventures box, and then there was the Game Adventures box. Now, me and Vicky love escape room style games. We love escape room style games. We love puzzle style games. So the Unlock series is a series which we very much enjoy. Now, we are also part of the testing team and we do all of the editing of all of the English text. That does mean we get to play these games and test them out before they get released. But 
the downside is that the people who actually play them get more enjoyment out, out of them over them than we do because we're having to test them we're finding errors some parts don't work properly and we don't get as good an experience of playing those games as other people do when we play them i mean the work that we do hopefully increases the the the, the uh, and the enjoyment that other people get when they play them, um, but we still really enjoy them. And the reason why I've included uh, those games in my top 10, maybe one of them alone might not have made my top 10, but the two of them combined. The Legendary, the, the legendary Adventures contain some really good scenarios, and they kind of did different things with the integration of the app. Um, but also they released the game adventures. Now, according to BGG, it's 2021. I didn't think it came out till this year, but we're going with games that are down as the 2021 games according to Board Game Geek. And the Unlock Game Adventures is ones where there was a scenario for Ticket to Ride, there was a scenario for Pandemic, and there was a scenario for Mysterium. Now I've played all of those games and I was very skeptical about whether an Unlock scenario based on another board game that's an IP that's property of uh, Asmodee would work. But they did a fantastic job. All three of those were, were extremely good uh, scenarios to play, really enjoyable. So yeah, we, we love the Unlock series of games and we're very pleased and proud to be part of the team that helps, you know, as I say, make the English versions better. Uh, and we're going to be testing a whole boatload of them more soon. They're really popular, they're still coming out. There's a squeaking noise in the background, which is Loki. Do you agree? Do you like testing the Unlock scenarios as well? Oh, here he is. Yeah, anyway, so that is Unlock Legendary Adventures and Unlock Game Adventures which apparently were both released in 2021. Right, Loki's still with me, and Loki is going to tell you his number five game of 2021. And this might be a little bit of a surprise to people, because a lot of people watch my channel and know that I like the medium to heavy Euro games. And number five is the medium to heavy Euro game, So Clover. No, this is a, this is a party game. This is a fun party game. And when I, when I went through my big list of all of the games from 2021 that I've played and I picked out my favourites, this one was straight in there. This, this one's definitely in my top 10 and it's like, well, well how high is it going to be? And I sat down last night going, going through the list again and I was thinking, well, would I prefer to play this than that? And would I prefer to play? And it's like, yeah, So Clover is fantastic. Now, this is by the same publisher as Just One, Repost Productions, um, but it's, it's nothing like Just One in a way. I mean, it's a fun party game that you can play, but the benefits of So Clover is that you're all playing simultaneously, uh, you're all creating a clue for everybody else, and then you go around the table and everybody has to guess their clues. This is a game which is one of those games which is such a simple idea, but works extremely well. And in fact, I might actually prefer this one to just one, because... I don't know, it, it just, it's, it's more fun. And, and the weird thing about this game is that when you're putting together the puzzle and you get those four cards and you put them in your grid and you're like, oh no, how the heck am I gonna come up with a word that links these two things together? Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you get these two words that just don't link together whatsoever. However, you're not just making one clue, you're making four. And that's where the cleverness in this game comes in. If you've got two words together that you just can't link, well, just forget that, because look at the one on the side. And then the one on the side, you've got something like, you know, whatever, church and hat. So you go, well, well, well I'll put bishop. And then when people are guessing it, they go, well, bishop, church, that, that must be it. It can't be anything else. So that card goes in there, which means the other one then fits into place. So yeah, when you're putting the clue together, you're probably thinking, nobody's ever gonna get this, this is really difficult. But when you put it in front of the people and everybody starts guessing, uh, it, it just works really well. I think comparing it to just one, I think this game works probably best at four players, whereas just one probably works best at six and seven. And the reason for that is, um, apart from the player who put the clue together, everybody else is guessing it. And if you've got too many people, you can have that situation where some people might feel a bit left out. So yeah, what does it say on the box? It says three to six players. Yeah, that's probably about right. I would probably choose, I mean, I have played it with three and it's fine. Uh, whereas just one with three doesn't work so well. So yeah, probably better at a lower player count. If I had six or seven people or eight people, I'd play just one. If I had three, four or five people, I would play So Clever. But yeah, So Clever, it's just a lot of fun. Really good. Played it loads of times. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Coming in at number four is a game which a lot of people have rated the best game of 2021 
and for some people has become their best game of all time. For me, Ark Nova is definitely one of the best games that came out in 2021, but I'm not jumping on the bandwagon and saying this is the best game since sliced bread. Uh, Ark Nova is a very good game. It is definitely in the heavy category. I probably wouldn't even put it in the medium to heavy category. I'd, I'd probably put it definitely closer to the heavy category. Um, but I've played this game about 10 or 12 times, I think, now. Uh, and I've played the solo game. And I really enjoy Ark Nova. I think it's a great game. I think it's uh, a good quality design and production. The reason why it's not higher on my list is the next three games. I prefer more than this one. But that's, that's no discredit to this one. Now, there are some things about this game that I'm not too keen on. Uh, it suffers from the issue of a huge deck of cards and every single card is unique. Now, every single card is unique is great because you've got so much variability, you've got so much of that going on. But the card cycling in this game is not as much as I would have liked. And what that means is that you can get some games where you get cards that suit your strategy or you don't get cards that suit your strategy. For example, you, you play a card in round one which gives you a bonus uh, every time you introduce a new bird into your, your zoo. Uh, and then you don't get any more birds for the rest of the game. That can happen, okay? In a, in a game where you've got a massive deck of cards, then you're going to be prone to things like that. And that's one of the issues with the game. I'm not saying that's an issue which is a big issue or it's going to stop me playing the game, but it is, it is something that's there. Uh, the graphic design is clear it's a bit weird in some places it looks like it's like 20 years old in some places and the money chips are awful but as a game it's very very good the solo mode is a bit disappointing uh in the way that again the the cards just don't cycle enough um but it, it is enjoyable to play uh and yeah as i say I'm, I'm i'm rating this in my top 10 games i do enjoy playing this there isn't a time when i would probably not say no to a, a game of this it very much feels like multiplayer solitaire apart from a couple of parts of the game. So I think probably two player might be the best, maybe three. Um, you, for me, you're not going to get a better experience playing this game with more than two or three. It isn't sufficiently different, is what I'm saying, apart from the playtime, uh, which could be a bit long for your first game. But I know that once you've played this game a few times, I think you can get a four player game done in like two and a half, three hours. So it's not the excessively long game that a lot of people are expecting it to be except for maybe when you're first first learning the game. So anyway, that, that is Ark Nova. Right, coming in at number three, and I can already hear the complaints coming in about this, but I've put Great Western Trail 2nd Edition as my number three game of 2021. And the complaints coming in are probably going to be, well, Great Western Trail is an old game. Why are you covering it in 2021? Well, the second edition came out in 2021. Is the second edition sufficiently different from the first edition? Probably not. It's probably 95% the same game. But Great Western Trail, for me, is a masterpiece of a game. It's a top 10 game for me of all time. And the second edition makes a few tweaks that just make the game better. Now, I'm not a fan of the new artwork. Uh, I really prefer the old artwork. And the new cowboy hats are great, but they're a bit, bit top heavy and they fall over. Um, but as a game, I, I could not, not put Great Western Trail uh, in, in, in my top 10 games. It was released in 2021, and Great Western Trail is a fantastic game. I could play this game 200, 300 times, and I'd still enjoy it. This is an absolute, almost perfect game for me. It is a medium to heavy Euro with really interesting decisions. I love the gameplay. I love the, uh, the emerging gameplay as the game develops. I love all the different strategies that you can do in the game. It's almost a perfect game, Great Western Trail, for me. I just absolutely love it. So, yeah, Great Western Trail 2nd Edition uh, came out in 2021. 2022 saw Great Western Trail Argentina, and Great Western Trail New Zealand will be out in 2023. Whether they will make the, my top 10s of that year, who knows? But as far as, me, uh, as far as 2021 goes, Great Western Trail, base game, number three for me. Right, so it's come to that point and I've been agonising, I mean literally agonising about this for the last two months. I have two games that are my top two games of 2021 and I have been unable to choose between them and I have literally spent two months, it's one of the reasons why this video is late, I have spent two months agonising over this, over this decision and I'm afraid I'm going to cop out. 
I am going to have two joint favourite games of 2021. So I don't have a number two. I have two number ones. And the reason for that is, as I say, two months of me thinking about it and I've been unable to separate them. Um, I cannot decide between these two games at all. So I'm going to cover them now, but this is not in any order. So the first of my number one games is, of no surprise to most people, because I've already told people, <laughs> I've been telling people for the last six months that Bitoku is my number one game of 2021. Um, it's my joint number one game of 2021. So Bitoku, interesting story about this. I didn't really have any knowledge of Devere Games or any relationship with them until 2021 when they reached out to me. Uh, and I've been speaking to a couple of people and I now have a good relationship with uh, with Devere Games. But Matt from Devere Games reached out to me a few months before Essenspiel 2021 and said, Paul, uh, we're wondering if you'd like to call by the booth and pick up a review copy of, of, of Bitoku. And I initially went back and said no. And the reason for that is during 2021 was the, was the time when I started to feel completely overwhelmed by the amount of new games coming out, by the amount of games that I was covering on the channel, and by the sheer backlog of my games that were building up and up and up, and I just didn't have time to cover them. So I, I took a quick look at it, and I said, well, it looks very nice, and a lot of people are raving about it, but I'm going to say no because I just don't have time to cover all of the games that I have covered. Then about two weeks before Essen, when lots of other people were telling me, Bitoku is your kind of game, I went back to Devere Games and I said, can I change my mind on that and could I pick up a review copy of it? And they said, sure, absolutely. And I'm so glad I did. Now, this game isn't without its problems. And that's probably ended up why I've ended up putting it my joint number one. The rulebook has issues. There are a few things in the rulebook. The structure of the rulebook is pretty bad. There are a few things in the rulebook that are really not clear, like put something on a starting space without telling you what the starting space is, and it just looks like all the other spaces. Um, you know, the fireflies and the dragonflies, the terminology change. There's, the rulebook's not a massive, massive issue. A lot of people say it's awful. I found it mostly okay, but there were definitely a few issues with the rulebook. The graphic design, I think, is fine. The artwork, a lot of people have complained, is too busy. They said the board is way too busy. And I, I get that. I totally get that. The board looks completely overwhelming. For me, though, I didn't have a problem with it. I see past that artwork, and I just see the key information that I need to see. So there's the problems with the game. Why, why do I love the game so much? Every single time I've played this, I've loved it. From the first time I played it, right through to the last time I played it, and I think I've played it about six or seven times, I just love playing it. I've played it at two, three, and four players. Um, the two-player game was weird and very tight, um, but yeah, I, I just love playing it. There's something about this game, and it, it's hard to put my finger on it, but everything about it just fits with me. Now, I have absolutely no interest in the theme. The theme of the game, based on the Studio Ghibli artwork, animations, what, I, I don't know anything about that. I, I, I don't know anything about it. I have no interest in it whatsoever. So I'm not enjoying this game because of the theme. And apparently there's a little bit of thematic integration with the game. I don't care about that because I don't know anything about the theme. I'm talking about it purely from a mechanical point of view. I love the way that the dice placement works. I love the fact that you can upgrade your dice. You move them across the river for the second reaction. The timing of that when you're combining it with timing with other things and interacting, interacting with the other players in, in, in terms of, well, I want that bonus first. There's lots of different mechanisms in here. Uh, there's, there's a lot in here. This is a medium to heavy Euro game, possibly verging on the heavier side, just because there's a lot of, oh, and then there's that. Oh, and you can get this, and you can get these stones, and if you put these things around the stones, you'll get more points. Oh, and there's these cards as well. There's a lot going on. But as I say, I love the game. Every single time I've played it, I've loved playing it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just one of those games that, that ticks all of my boxes. So I'm able to forgive some of the issues with the game, because playing it is is such a joy. And I, I just want to play it again now. Now, I've not played the solo game. In fact, I'm probably not going to play the solo game of this. It is designed by David Turtsey, uh, who's a friend of mine, and I know David really well. Uh, but his solo modes do tend to be, for me, a little bit too much on the complexity side um, with the way that the AI works. And I've spoken to people who have played the solo game of this, and they've said to me, yeah, Paul, this is probably not a solo mode that's, that suited you. But that's fine. That's absolutely fine. The multiplayer game is where it's at for me with this game. Uh, and yeah, really, really enjoy it. So my other 
number one game of 2021 is Imperial Steam. And I'm a little bit surprised that this game is, is my joint number one. And this is the agony that I've had. Bitoku, that I've just been talking about, is an absolute joy to play. And I absolutely love it, right? I will admit to you, I probably enjoy playing Bitoku more than I enjoy playing Imperial Steam. Only just. So why is this my joint number one? Well, the issues that Bitoku has, this has none of them. Now, this game was described to me, I think it might have even been Clay from Capstone Games, that described this to me as Lignum with trains. Now, Lignum, which is the designer's, one of the designer's previous games, it didn't go down well with me. I played Lignum once and... Hated it, was probably a bit strong, but I really, really didn't like it. Now, that could have been down to the awful rulebook and the bad graphic design, but Lignum for me was just an absolute miss. I really didn't like it. So when this was described as Lignum with trains, I was like, uh-oh, I'm a little bit worried about it. But I took a look at it and I thought, this actually looks really interesting. And the game is just, this is, this is a great game, right? Very, very clever design. Very great, uh, very, very good mechanisms in the way that it works. Really important decision points in the game. Uh, and as I say, rulebook is really good. Graphic design is really good. As a package, production quality is fantastic as well. Overall, as a package, this is a better package than Bitoku, which is why I've put it in my number one, uh, which is why I've got it as, as my joint number one. Um, it's very difficult for me to find fault with this game. Other than, I already know this is not a game for everybody because this has got a dry theme, you're building trains and you're doing all of that. Now, if you like those kind of games, you definitely need to try this. Um, this is not an 18xx style game, if you're worried about that. I'm not a big fan of 18xx style games, so it's not that. But there's just so many things about this game that are really, really good. Um, and yeah, now it is two to four players. There isn't a solo mode for this game, which is fine. It means that I don't need to play it. Um, but And I'm not very good at this game. In fact, I'm terrible at this game. I don't think I've ever won a game of this. Um, but I can see it's very, very clever in the way that it works. And this game has a certain tension to it as well. Because if one player builds uh, the trike all the way to the end, then the game ends early. And if you don't reach the end then there's basically two ways the game can end, whether you've managed to build to, the, to, to uh, is it Trieste? I think it's Trieste that you're trying to get to, or Vienna, whatever. Um, and if you do, then certain scorings work in one way, and if you don't, they work in a different way. So there, there is this tension to the end of the game, and some games I've played, we've got to the end, and other games we've played, we haven't got to the end. It could have been when we were just learning. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's difficult for me to talk about this game too much, because... Again, when I was going through my list of, of top 10 games, I just went, well, Imperial Steam is, is definitely in there. It, it's, just, it's just absolutely fantastic. I remember reading through the rulebook for the first time and just going, you know, it, it's difficult for me to read through rulebooks and not find faults with them because of the work that I do. Um, but yeah, reading through the rulebook, I was like, this, this is just a joy. And then I played it for the first time and I was like, this is very, very good. And then I've played it, I don't know, I think maybe four times, something like that. Yeah, it's just exceptional. So yeah. Imperial Steam. There we go. That is it. Let's get the two out. Imperial Steam and Bitoku. Apologies to those people who think I've copped out. I mean, I have copped out, but for, for good reason. Um, again, two months of thinking about this. And I think one of the reasons why I've put these both of my joint number ones is that the ultimate choice I had is I couldn't favour one over the other for different reasons. And I felt it was unfair on the other one if I put one ahead of the other. If I put Bitoku ahead of Imperial Steam, because I love the game and I enjoy playing it a huge amount, I can't not highlight the issues with, you know, the rulebook and things like that. Because for me, I'm evaluating the whole package. Whereas Imperial Steam might not be as much fun and enjoyable to play as Bitoku, but as a package, very, very well done. So there we go. That is it. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, next year, I'm going to plan to do this around the summer because to be honest I, I could have probably made this list around uh, the summertime but various things have gone wrong this year and I've ended up delaying it so I've managed to get it out just in time but yeah next year I'm aiming to do my top 10 games of 2022 somewhere around the summer. Uh, a big thank you again to all of my patron supporters who fund the channel and make these videos possible. If you like the content that I create, if you've enjoyed this video, as I say leave me a comment in the description let me know what your favourite game of 2021 was 
2021, not 2022. Uh, and yeah, keep watching. Subscribe to the channel, give the video a like, all of that usual stuff. If you are in a position to be able to support me on Patreon and help fund the channel, patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching.